Welcome again to An Abundant Future with Matt Powers. I'm your host, Matt Powers. This podcast is a place where we discuss, talk, and explore regenerative solutions that can be worked into our lives now. Things that are actually happening, new ideas, even things that are coming down the pipe. We're talking about it here. So thank you so much for joining us and trying to live more regeneratively. Today, we're talking to Brad Gates. Brad is a friend of mine and he does the most amazing thing. He creates new varieties of tomatoes and he teaches people how to do it themselves. And it's a concept that you can apply outside of the tomato world too. So let's just dive right in right now with with Brad and you're gonna love this. Here we go. So I'm so excited to have you on here, Brad. We've had many conversations. We've known each other for years. We've done some videos together. I am a huge fan of your tomatoes. I've been growing them forever. Um, And I just want to share with everyone your story because it's a story of discovery and excitement, enthusiasm. And that's, you know, mirrored in every gardener. But for you, it took on this whole new dimension and you went from conventional to becoming one of the, the, the leading edges in heirloom and organic gardening by creating over 60 new varieties and still, and still growing, still, still growing and still going um, in only 20 years. So how did yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did this all start? <laughs> um, it's started, um, it's been a little over 20 years ago, actually it started when I decided to work a Saturday for a friend doing farmer's markets. Uh, he'd been doing them for a while and there are more farmer's markets popping up all over and these weird tomatoes called heirlooms were kind of resurfacing, so to speak. And um, I got a crash course on heirloom tomatoes. <laughs> I'd never seen yellow and pink and multicolors. Um, all I'd pretty much seen was round, red, and tasteless before that. Yeah, me too. And then, and then you came on the scene with all that. So, so did you? So you found out about heirlooms. You saw these things that were hitting. Um, and and then you got into breeding them. So how did that happen? Yeah, so I guess yeah, it all started when I worked uh, one summer for a friend. And I thought, oh, well, this is great. Everybody says thanks. You know, you leave with pockets full of cash, and uh, you know, so I'm going to be a tomato farmer. And uh, so it started with that, and I grew hundreds of plants or whatever. And I realized, well, it's definitely no fast money here. You might might even make a thousand dollars that day, but little little if any of it's probably going to be years when it's all all said and done with all the work. But uh, I started trying to find the tomatoes that would, so to speak, make the customers come crawling back on their hands and knees begging for more. I wanted to, you know, have the best tomatoes at the market. So I trialed a couple hundred varieties of heirloom tomatoes. Actually, I had a couple people send me dozens and dozens of varieties each. So it was cool. I got to trial early on a whole bunch of tomatoes and kind of found out that, uh, maybe 10 or 20% of them were good. The other ones were marginal or didn't fit the market or didn't do well in your climate or any of these other things. And then I started at the same time learning that that these heirloom tomatoes were special. You could keep your own seeds from them. And, uh, you know, I grew up product of the hybrid generation and I thought, wow, these are cool and old fashioned. You can keep the seeds from them. And uh, I started researching a little bit about seed saving because there was some varieties that I had and I wanted to just um, keep them going or uh, you know have the seeds to grow out for market and um, somewhere in there once in a while they'll cross accidentally Um, an insect can typically it's less than 5% of the time or so they usually self pollinate but you can have an insect come and accidentally cross a tomato and I just happened to save some seeds from some natural crosses and um, I was growing thousands of plants by this time and I was out there picking some stuff and some of the tomatoes were a little bit different and I remember 
picking one and going, wow, I've grown almost 200 varieties, never seen one that looked like this, and bit into it and thought, wow, I've tasted over 200 varieties, and I've, that's as good as anything I've ever eaten. So I then started doing a little more research on dehybridizing, um, stabilizing, making an open pollinated form, just like heirlooms are, how you could do it with successive generations of growing a lot of plants and picking the best of the best each year. Uh, stabilize that uh, that cross, so that's kind of what I did. I started developing my own varieties originally just to kind of stand out and be get away from some of the competition at farmers markets and uh seemed like everywhere i went everybody kept telling me man these are the best tomatoes i've ever had and that's kind of what kept me going um um going with the breeding and everything you know and one time i'm the only person in the whole world holding something like pink berkeley tie-dye in my hand and i'm going man the the tomato world can't be without this (laughs) and uh that's what kind of kept me uh nature kind of had me lassoed and forced me to carry on their work her work for so right so speaking of of those early varieties which ones do you have currently you just said the pink berkeley tie-dye which is a wonderful amazing tomato you know that's another one of my tomatoes that i threw sue and came through um which is really interesting i think the more we work with genetics the more we get these extent benefit extensions within the plant where there's just more intelligence going on because they're just they've just been turned on more you know what I mean they've been they're they're having more sex they're they're learning more they're you know what I mean they're gaining a lot more information than uh these varieties that are true to true to true every year there's a lot more going on so what, what else was one of the early ones other than pink berkeley um Black and brown boar was one. It's basically, you know, like a dark chocolate colored green zebra. That was I'm one familiar. that I found on, uh, <laughs> that was actually, I had a couple hundred green zebra plants in the field at the time. And one of them just happened to turn into this chocolate brown looking one. And it has a really intense, rich flavor, um, different flavor profile than wow. the green zebra, but still had the striping and, um, and that's one of the things when I first started, I had some unique striped tomatoes show up. Um, and at the time it was pretty much green zebra, and maybe a, one or two other striped varieties. So the, the playing field was wide open for me to develop all these varieties. Every time I got a one of a kind, you know, I had a up the pink Berkeley tie dye. I had uh, one big giant yellow one that was amazing. And from that formed pork chop you know a great yellow tomato so every time a a new shape or size or color with striping came out i could pick that and then it was a process of growing hundreds of plants over generations and sometimes picking you know one or two plants to select seeds from out of say 100 plants just to early on in the early generations trying to improve the flavor and stuff Um, always growing growing a lot of them and only selecting a few of them for seeds each year trying to improve the the flavor production everything else that's seriously powerful most people don't get that their their seed savers are saving every single seed um, and they're building a land race sure they're getting the small guys with the big guys the tall guys you know they're doing that whole thing they're building a land race they don't realize they're not actually being selective they're not honing that in any direction <laughs> yeah yeah if everybody makes a cut there's actually no improvement you go the opposite way so right um, right and and that does its own thing i mean land race opening it up to land races means that you get all this you know middle ground and then you could pull it all these different ways but it does water things down a lot at the same time sure sure so, so, so yeah, that's one thing to, to point out is uh, if you have a garden and you have an, an intentional or unintentional cross um, and something really unique, one of a kind shows up in your garden, you better save some seeds because you get one chance and one chance only to capture that unique you know, set of genes, and that potential to for some new variety, whether it's a tomato or whether it's even... Um, 
any other product in the garden. Yeah, absolutely. So you went from finding these accidents, following these accidents, and then you started creating accidents, and then you went to the the, the furthest extreme. You went to the wilderness. <laughs> you went to the wild, and you and you got this these wild tomato genes, these black purp like so dark purple, they're black, small and edible yeah. tomatoes. So it was kind of cool after splashing stripes on almost every size, shape, and color in general that I could. Then um, the blue anthocyanin um, tomatoes came out. And actually, originally, Oregon State University was the ones, as far as I know, that discovered the the wild tomato that um, expressed the anthocyanin in the skin. It was a, a really bad tasting, pretty much a non-edible type of tomato, but um, I had a couple different friends actually take the wild tomato and cross it with some of my varieties and send me some seeds early on, just figuring they'd be in good hands and I had the ability to grow thousands of plants and select some of the best of the best out of some of those crosses and stuff. So yeah, that's how I first got it. And again, then all of a sudden the the tomato playing field was pretty much wide open, whether it was a cherry tomato or a unique color or even beef steaks. They've been kind of some of the last. The original parent was a small tomato, so it was actually one of the harder things to do is get up to beef steak size and still have the anthocyanin expression. So, yeah, now all of a sudden the tomato world can be rewritten again. <laughs> and I always wonder, okay, well, what's next? You know, what's, what's the next direction? Um, Incredible. There'll always be something. So in the past 20 years, the tomato has probably changed more. I mean, I don't know of, I know of people who preserve tomato genetics, but I don't know of any other tomato breeders like yourself. There's commercial ones, of course, you know, but they're trying to go for the one trick pony. <laughs> You're creating catalogs of new tomatoes. I mean, this half wild or partial wild, you know, tomato in oh, like you said it rewrites the whole book of tomatoes altogether. Yeah, and there's definitely several uh breeders either professional, semi-professional or hobby and it, and it, it's increasing all the time because it's creating a new interest um in the garden, making gardening more exciting or whatever um, by creating your own or growing the unknown, watching it develop, um, seeing extreme results sometimes, having something nobody else around you has. That's all part of the gardening excitement. So it's definitely added added to that aspect. And you know, there's definitely, there's several people doing it to different levels. But, and it's uh, I see it increasing all the time. I just happened to, I guess maybe I did it before it was cool. I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. I was just <laughs> taking a cool one of a kind tomato, growing a bunch of them, and selecting the chosen ones each generation um, after that until it takes typically five to seven years to stabilize a cross um, to grow from from a, a the the cross until you can. Um, dependably grow the seeds and, and dependably have the, the outcome that you want on the tomato. It's typically about five to seven years. That's if everything goes right. And you have a lot of numbers to play with. Absolutely. So speaking of, you know, the greater community, I, I foresee this this spreading. Like, And I, I, I mean, it's spread. It caught me up. There's this... I see it spreading, but I also foresee it going much further. And it, I mean, right now in corn, because corn is so, wants, it really just wants to kind of breed and create new, new varieties of corn. Um, I'm working with corn. I know there's people working with beans, um, new varieties yeah. to replace yeah. those lost potatoes, ones. Potatoes, everything's going through a new renaissance, and it's good because. Uh, just, just like corn, what is what do we get when we eat sweet corn? Oh, you want white or yellow? And it's like, well, how about, you know, there's reds and blues and tan colors and everything, and there's, you know, nutty flavors and creamy flavors and everything else. It's not just we're gone very monoculture 
in America in general. We definitely have been coming out of it for years now, but um, having a new food revolution where all of a sudden, you know, you can grow 20 something varieties of, you know, really, really good potatoes and, you know, all just endless actually. Um, even some of the brassicas that they're crossing where you have edible florets, you have edible leaves and edible stems, you have months of growth. Um, the you know, the world could easily handle several thousand new um, um, Mar- or, uh, Martin Luthers, you know, to just go crazy and cross stuff and select and and find some u- unique and usable plant species. Absolutely, and uh, I mean it's it's so true that the novelty drives the market. Um, and I meant to say I meant to say Luther Burbank, not Martin Luther. <laughs> <laughs> Both are good. Up. Both are good. Um, but then there's the superior taste. I mean, the novelty of it. It's new. Then there's the visual of it. It's shocking. The colors. I mean, the first sweet corn. If we brought back the sor- first sweet corn. Supposedly there might be some trace genetics of it. It was black sweet corn. <laughs> um, so we have these visuals, you know, that are, are, are opposite what we expect. So right at this time, it's such a sweet moment where almost anyone could take a course from you, could take a course, you know, from, from a lot of these individuals who are out there working on it's like Stephen Smith with corn. Uh, he's working on a course right now in a book. And people could create something exciting that could take like completely flip the market and we could have new foods become the new thing and it's like what's coming out this year well this year we have pink sweet corn and it's huge and it you know and and it's all natural (laughs) we can celebrate these backyard growers who are these you know innovative champions it you know and it, it all it all starts with education and inspiration and that's what you're providing it's really exciting So, you have classes. Do you have any uh, local classes coming up? Um, no, I did several throughout the spring, kind of um, different nurseries and stuff that I, some garden clubs and things like that. So, um, the Heirloom Expo in September will be the, the next time I actually talk or whatever at this point. Awesome. Well, People should be marking their calendars to catch you there. I love your tomato tower there. I don't know if I'll be there this year. I, I'm supposed to be there with the uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab and the World Beat Cultural Center. Um, but regardless of whether I'm there or not, I'm going to be up at uh, the, food, the Soil Not Oil conference, and that's right there, so we'll drop by and visit. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be great to see your new location and uh, the new varieties you got going. All right. And so next things that are on your radar, things that are on the horizon, things that are coming up. You're planning a, a online course in a book, right? <laughs> I am actually, yes. And I've been, I've been working on it, and it's just become almost a... Uh, thought it was going to be easy and it's become a semi-monster but it's uh it's going well um i got a lot of information documented i've always wanted to write a book the first one that i'm going to write will be kind of a smaller version lots of tips tricks um how to's what's worked for me what hasn't worked for me um different grow examples all the way from growing in a a two-gallon bucket to growing in fertile ground um so yeah, I'm gonna try to sell some of my 20-something years in the tomato trenches uh, knowledge and things that I've learned. And um, part of my progression, I think, like you were saying, I started off. You know, the guy I learned from was just a handful of triple sixteen by the drip emitter type of a farmer, and then it was an interesting um, path I took learning about organics. I started going to different farms, and I started observing that these people that were using a lot of compost and organic fertilizers and stuff um, were getting way more life out of their plants, way less disease pressure, um, weren't even spraying for disease in most cases and had healthier plants than the guy that just made a sixth trip through the garden with a little spray 
attachment off you know and uh so that was kind of my learning experience and, and evolved into into that too so i want to share all that different information with people that's gonna be amazing oh man i cannot wait I I am a huge fan. All right, I'm just going to let it all out. Here we go. So the golden tomatoes with the blue tops are my favorite cherry tomatoes. I thought that the black cherries were my favorite, but when you came out with the blue gold, crazy. Yeah, the gold the gold berry. Yeah, that one's uh, really good. And those, those things are so hardy, too. You know, they'll grow in the cracks of the sidewalk. It's another benefit to... Um, that the the blueberry and the goldberry they're both related we said a different color which actually creates a different flavor profile the the yellow one has a little more of a clean sweet flavor to it but uh yeah they're very determined growers um there's it was kind of interesting when the crosses with the wild tomato and some of my varieties sometimes when you go for say a specific trait to use a certain um, variety to get that trait you can get a lot of um, with a genetic drag or whatever bad t- traits that come up that you have to sort through to get the one you want and okay you want the blue tomato so really some of the bad things in the beginning was the flavor the the wild tomato was the flavor was so t- horrible that it took a couple good few generations and you know thousands of plants to really find some when i finally got to the point where i like, okay that's you know one of the better tomatoes i've had that's a good one so this is going to work so um some of the non um some of the other great things is the anthocyanin that's produced in the skin from uv light and i've noticed if the plant struggles or it gets really hot um, it can kind of turn purple too. So, without being a scientist, <laughs> I can't confirm this, but it's a, it's a it's a chemical that the plant puts out to protect itself. It just happens to be a cool looking antioxidant. So, when the plant's under stress, you know they release certain chemicals to help them through. So that's actually what this uh, anthocyanin ends up doing. So what I've found out is it rather protects the tomatoes pretty well. Um, I've gotten good to great disease resistance um, with it. I've also gotten um, interesting, good production with interesting like flower truss formations where they're almost like, I don't know if it's a word, but I call it hyper flowering. You know, they're just sending out flowers that come on top of the other ones and keep extending out. And um, so I'm seeing a lot of really good, great positive traits that were um, mixed in with that wild genetics. Wow. I wonder what else, like what, what next, yeah, what next for tomatoes, what next for for so many foods? I know that there's about 30,000 edible foods out there. We focus on 11 foods. And... <laughs> and so many of them came yeah. from uh, Latin America, Central America, and tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, lima beans, you know, corn, they're all from those areas. And those are, you know, a third to a half of our staple foods. So there's just so yeah. much that could happen at this point. Um, I've got wild pepper seeds. Do you know Chris Fowler, the pepper guy? Uh yeah, 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 Wales, yeah. He, yeah, he is a real nice guy. I don't know if he knows that I'm Welsh, but um, I'm about a third <laughs> Welsh. So he's been, he sent me like all these packages. Of, you know how everyone's like all crazy about the habanada? He sent me a yeah. dozen. They're called sweet Chinese, and they're they're actually from uh, a lot of them are from uh, South America, but they're they're like that that hot pepper flavor, but they're sweet. So he's a, I mean, he's another person that's really trying to push the limit um, with it with his chili peppers and create new things. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, and then even like with the potatoes, with the TPS, the true potato seed and stuff, and they're kind of like apples. Everyone's going to be different, but you can clone them from that generation just by you can have that one of a kind potato plant and keep tubers from it. And uh, so there's some really crazy neat potatoes that have surfaced and you know i like i tell people tomatoes have changed more in the last 10 years than they have on their whole existence on the planet 
you know, and it's only getting better. The bar's being raised. Um, mediocre tomatoes won't be tolerated anymore. You know, you got um, different flavors, different uh, growth habitats. Another thing with a lot of the diversity that I had in some were selecting for like early varieties other ones were good they just happened to be late some did good in hot conditions some in cool and i've had people tell me well you know they've had good success with some of my varieties growing outdoors in say seattle and some people have had good success growing some of my varieties some of the more heat tolerant ones in texas or arizona and that's one of the other benefits of having so much diversity now you have um enough cards in the deck to where everybody can be a player. You can grow tomatoes in a cool climate, a hot climate, a humid climate. Um, there's, you know, with the expansions of new varieties, different ones are going to do good. And that's why I kind of try to tell people too, is test drive new varieties as many as you can each year. You know, you're going to, you're likely to find your new favorite or you can find ones that, um, like your conditions. Not all of them will, but, um, some of them will no matter where you're at yeah and then come you know maybe breed some of those together and see what kind of new combinations and because taking the best of the best and then combining them and letting nature then start painting with that palette of colors you can get yeah then, yeah it blow your mind <laughs> <laughs> yep yep that's all, that's also true too um um, if you were a hobby breeder and you thought, well, where am I going to start? Well, how about taking your two favorite tomato varieties that you like, both for because they like your climate and you know they produce good for you and they have good flavor, and cross those two and grow as many plants as you can the next generation and see what happens. Um, and actually, interestingly, the I'll explain real quick on that. The F1 uh, is. The only, when you cross a tomato, the only thing that crosses that year is the DNA and the seeds. And the next year, they all come out the same, and it might not even represent what's what's about to happen. Because the F2 and the F3, the second and third generation, is when it gets exciting. Because the, the first generation of a stable cross, you take two stable parents, you cross them, you'll get an offspring, and they'll all look the same. The next generation, they'll express aunts and uncles and grandparents and everything, all these different uh, um, colors, shapes, sizes, flavors, and textures that weren't even in the original um, tomato that you used to cross, but it had relatives that did have these qualities. So that's when it kind of gets really exciting is in your second and third generation of your cross, and that's when all kinds of cool stuff can can appear and then you're out there going oh the tomato world can't be without this <laughs> saving seeds from it taking notes and uh growing as many plants you can again the next year and then like with today's ability with the internet and stuff there's always people out there sometimes you can send a half dozen here and a dozen there and get different results and and friend up with somebody and kind of uh throw it back and forth you know to kind of um increase the fun, increase the number of plants that can be grown from across. Yeah, you know, I'm right now, I have that purple speckled Peruvian corn, the daylight sensitive corn. That's actually uh -huh. uh, being grown on 20 different sites. I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, we'll see if it, if it, it was two years. Steven Smith says it, it should, most of the changes happen that first year. Um, but we'll see. I'm growing it here in Yorba Linda, um, in Orange County. I'm growing it down in San Diego. People are growing it in Colorado at like 9,000 feet or something crazy. So it's all over the map. Or no, no, no. Sorry. 6,000 feet. Um, <laughs> flip that nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great though. Then you just, you get a broader, um, idea of, what it's about or whatever and each one of those people have whether it's good or bad a fail or a success it's uh an interesting fun project to um at least attempt to try to do something like that you never know when mother nature's gonna say no that ain't gonna happen <laughs> she can yank the carpet out from under your feet at any time but 
It can happen. And you know, it's funny. Sometimes it, it, you, she'll let you take a couple years with the plant. She'll be like, oh, yeah, we're going to have a mild winter this year. And you're like, oh, it happened. My golden berries are going to be fine. We're going to have moringa. It's going to be frost. And this uh, hard frost goes that, that inch deeper into the soil or something. And then that root, yeah. Just, yeah. So it happens. But, but that's a big plus for diversity too. And I think I was reading about the potato farmers in Peru, and on the average, about thirty, forty percent of their crop fails. They, you know, have different potato varieties from like sea level all the way to high up in the mountains, and um, different things and different zones happen each year. So they're, you don't really look at it as a thirty percent failure you look at it as a, they average about a 70 percent success you know so they're diversified enough enough varieties enough locations they get enough food to sustain themselves but um if they had all their you know they don't have all their potatoes in one field right and then it covers their potatoes are thousands of varieties and they cover like so many different conditions and flavor profiles and colors and it's really, it's really unbelievable that it all comes from, you know, this one collection of cultures that extends from Central America into South America. Yeah, very. What else is out there? <laughs> or what else could have been, you know, because most of these things have been nursed and nurtured by humans for generations to get to where they're at. Um, even the tomato was a very small little um, fruit but it didn't take in reality that long to turn to big beautiful beef steaks yeah and you know what's crazy to me at least is that you you kind of like went back and this is what I you know I think you inspired Stephen Smith because I don't know if you heard him this year but he's talking about how he wants to take Tio Sinte and cross it um, and figure out if he can if he can take it back to crossing Teosinte and create something um, that's like uh, more perennialized, more wild. Yeah, yeah. What else was in the card of decks that that originally came from, right? <laughs> yeah, he keeps going for the earliest corn he can find, and and Teosinte is still around. And those early links from Teosinte to corn. You know, other than the pod corn, that grandfather corn where each kernel is wrapped in a husk, there really isn't any example other than Teosinte. And there's, I think, at least three types of Teosinte. There might be up to six. Um, so so he's working on that. And who knows what could come of that? We could we could find that we create the, you know, the healthiest corn that is ever possible. And it looks completely alien because I've been playing with corn and... You know, you talk about that hyper flowering thing. I've seen that with corn, and what corn will do is it will cob like um, a cob will turn into a petal on a flower where all, well, there's many cobs. And so you have this crown on top of the plant where the tassel is at the end of each cob. So the pollen tassel is not separated from the silk any longer. They're one thing, and it's in a crown, in a circle, and in an inner circle of corn ears. And I've, 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 I've grown this, and I've showed it to Steve. And Stephen had no, he'd never seen anything like it. He was like, this is old genetic expression stuff being thrown out. I've never seen this. He took pictures. Well, it's and hidden down in the deep yep. bottom part of the, <laughs> the, the, the yeah. So uh, there's mystery uh, waiting for us down there. Sure. And that's another reason why you don't ever want to miss one of a kind things that can happen like that because, um, you know, small mutations, crosses, whatever they are, um, if it's such a, it's a really positive thing, it might be your one chance to capture that, you know, whether it's a, a growth habitat, disease tolerance, flavor, looks, hopefully a combination of all of those. Well, you guys heard it here. Don't let those go. You got to capture those. You got to seed save those, and then you got to stabilize them, which takes some time, but is infinitely worth it. Not just for the regular biodiversity of, the, of you know the general ecology, the general you know seed pool, but because it can make life better for everyone. We can make better tomatoes. We can make better peppers. We can make better potatoes and corn. There's 
so much more enjoyment to be had out of our meals, out of our gardens, um, out of the way we manage these things too. Uh, I, I mean, maybe because I just, you know, I think now that I go back and I, I go through my memory, I realize now that I've been growing your tomatoes because they perform the best and I love the way they look. And so it's this two for probably four for five for thing that I don't, you know, maybe we pro- there's so many layers to it, you ever, you can never get to the bottom of it, but there's, I'm drawn to these tomatoes because they're completely unique and special. Uh, and they act different from all my other tomatoes. So, your website is wildboarfarms.com. And I got a, yeah, I like over sixty varieties of seeds. Um, I just had some shirts and stuff made up with my new cool logo. They're not quite up for sale yet because I'm finalizing that. And uh, I'll be writing a book. It's going to be really cool. Um, what else is going on? Um, yeah, so you're now. not so you're not out of anything. Uh, I know that Baker Creek sells out of uh, your seeds very quickly, so that's wonderful. So if you guys, huge Baker Creek fans, you can just go over to his website and all those tomato seeds that you know quickly sell out. You can be guaranteed to get them now. Yeah, I, I sell less and hold back a little bit, but yeah, and then Baker Creek's been great to me. They, you know, when you purchase through them, they give me. Um, like a royalty fee, which is good because there's no patenting open pollinated varieties. So, um, you know, like a voluntary royalty fee is the next best thing going. That gives um, money going towards the next cool tomatoes and the work that's already been done. So it's a cool thing. Yeah, and they've been doing that with lots of different, you know, seed uh, conservationists seed breeders, young, you know, people like Stephen Smith, you know, have a lot of yeah, promise. supporting different little unique, cool, mm-hmm. cool projects or whatever. I mean, that's what it, that's, you know, that is in the bottom line. That's what makes the wheel keep turning or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. And, you know, with the internet now, I've just been looking like Brad's Atomic Grape was kind of a, it's a super crazy, unique tomato i've had great success for it it just came out and i know they sold out of that and so i still had some and just even this morning i saw several people posted some really radical looking pictures of it and so with today's today's easier to get the word out than ever before and it's been helping me a lot in the last couple of years with you know social media and somebody posts some crazy badass looking tomato and then where'd you get it here it is it's that easy so that's definitely helped me out absolutely well your tomatoes are absolutely gorgeous and i'm so excited that to have you on and to share your message with everyone you know you guys can all do this you guys can participate and we need you to we need you to you know jump on the trolley hop on the trolley and join us yeah in breeding your own or get excited test drive them (laughs) yeah I always uh, one of my favorite things is hearing. Uh, I used to have a, a sun golden and early girl in my backyard, and it's your fault. Now I have you know thirty or forty tomato plants, and they're all different varieties. And you know it's like, oh, that's a great accomplishment for me. It makes me feel good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Brad. The garden. Cool. Always great talking with you. Hope to see you sooner than later. And. Uh, Actually, I'm sure we will actually be communicating again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, awesome, man. All right, great. That was awesome. I love talking to Brad. His story is really an incredible one, and I really look forward to the release of his book. Um, it's going to be really helpful to so many people, and I'm I'm just really excited for that, for his online courses, for it all to really explode, and then for the results to kick in, for there to be thousands of new varieties of tomatoes, for there to be, you know, for it to be impossible for us all to keep up with how big the movement gets. And I can't wait for that to happen. It's like Darren Doherty said last week. We want things to progress so fast 
that they go faster than our names, faster than credit, so that people are just doing it everywhere and they never even heard of PA Yeomans or Brad Gates. We want there to be a revolution of plant breeding. And you know, it starts with people like Brad doing the work, having the example, and having the education um, to, to share that information and to spread it. From an abundant future with my powers, have a regenerative week. Thank you.